let's keep the momentum moving forward. So uh, my name is Rashid Bashir. I'm a faculty member here in bioengineering and also Spartan head. Um, and uh, I will give you today sort of an overview uh, of a couple of projects um, within our group. We do a range of things. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to go to my website and look at all the things that we do. But broadly speaking, trying to interface engineering, biology, and medicine at a micro nano scale. Depending on time, actually, I'm going to probably just talk about our lab on chip projects. And if I get some time, I'll show you a couple of slides on some cellular systems work that we have been also doing. So within our group, we are very interested in various types of fabrication, all sorts of micro, nano, bio fabrication, silicon, MEMS, and even 3D lithography and 3D, um, uh, 3D printing. Um, and then we apply it to grand challenge problems. Um, so diagnostics for global health, and I'll give you examples of projects there. Um, cancer, individualized medicine. So I'll give you an example of a project here. And then we're also interested in building these 3D systems that are made of soft materials such as cells and hydrogels. I won't probably get time for that, but we'll, we'll see how we go, all right? So before I uh, go further, I don't know if, uh, how many of you have seen this, uh, this, uh, this plot? How many of you have seen this before? No one, okay. So this you might see various, you know, actually at the NSF, NIH program managers, you know, they, they're kind of starting to show this, this slide. So the x-axis is consideration of use, low and high, and the y-axis is, uh, is the quest for fundamental understanding, all right, low or high. So question is what drives our research? What drives your research? What drives you, right? So this top left quadrant is called the Bohr quadrant, okay? Because if you think about it, in pure basic research, you know, it's really, the, you don't worry about what it'll be used for, right? Uh, you, maybe the quest for fundamental understanding is high, I mean that you want to seek knowledge and advance the state of knowledge, right? Uh, that quadrant on the bottom right is called the Edison quadrant, right? Edison went about, used lots and lots of materials to eventually find one that worked. So the consideration of use was very high, but maybe there wasn't enough, you know, drive to really understand what's going on. And that top right one is called the Pasteur quadrant which is use-inspired basic research. So there was a very specific use that he had in mind, right? And he did a lot of basic work to get to that. So this is something, you know, we talk about, hopefully nobody's here. <laughs> hopefully you're not there, right? Hopefully nobody is, is, is in that quadrant. And there's no right and wrong. It depends on where, you know, what, what drives you, what drives your research groups, your advisors, and different things. But it's something that we all, I think, are more and more thinking about when we, when we talk about translational research or research that has some sort of an end goal or an impact in a particular disease or a particular application. Um, so that certainly we are trying to do more and more, sort of, you know, we'd like to be in that quadrant if we can. So just a side note. All right, so I'll uh, uh, talk about a couple of different grand challenges. We are very interested in diagnostics for HIV AIDS as a global health problem, and I'll talk about that for a while, and diagnostics in cancer and epigenetics. And through that, I'll give you then examples of technologies that we are developing, all right? So uh, just very quickly, this slide, you've probably seen this before, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on these introductions, but various things in biology, in biological world that, that are on this different size scale, right? So viruses are in the order of about 100 nanometers or less. Proteins are in the 10 nanometers or, or, or so. Um, and then on the right, you have things in silicon that we can fabricate uh, today, and it's pretty amazing because you can indeed in silicon fabricate structures at the same size or smaller than proteins, right? Uh, and then there are these bottoms up chemical self-assembled materials like quantum dots, nanotubes, graphene, right? So they're sort of chemically synthesized and they self-limit in some way to give it the characteristic dimension. And this whole area of 3D printing kind of falls in that space, I would say, right in the middle in terms of the size range, you know, you can use 3D printing. Now to actually, this is probably not exactly correct, it comes down to all the way to 100 nanometers or so using, using uh, two photon uh, laser polymerization. You can actually build structures that are in the 100 nanometer or higher. So anyway, we are interested in kind of combining these worlds from fabrication perspective and, and making useful structures. So I'll show you examples of micro scale and nano scale stuff. So one thing that we are very interested in is to develop point of care sensors, point of care biosensors that uh, could detect the state of disease uh, very rapidly, low cost, and in a multiplex manner. Um, so there is really an increasing need for devices like this. If you look in the market today in terms of what's available, there's very few examples, just really uh, limited to these few. Uh, of course, the whole glucose monitoring is a classic example of a point of care sensor. 
Uh, you can now go to the pharmacy and buy a test for cholesterol. You can buy that kit and use it yourself from a drop of blood. Pregnancy test is, of course, a point of care test. And then iStat, which has been purchased by Abbott, makes these cartridges. We use electrical sensors to, to detect blood gases and certain proteins. Right? So there's actually very few examples. We'd like to do m more of this. So one example in terms of in global health, if you look at this data, we're just collecting this for review, we are submitting actually. So causes of death from infectious diseases, and we just looked at actually all countries uh, worldwide where 70% of the mortality, let's say, adds up to, you know, for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. And this is the total number of deaths due to various um, infectious diseases. And you can see that HIV, AIDS is certainly right there up at the top in terms of number, of number of deaths due to the specific diseases. So we're talking about huge numbers. The lower respiratory infections is a combination of things. If you break it down, they'll all be down here, but that is usually lumped to, I mean, together also. Uh, so uh, looking at, again, HIV a little bit more, um, this is the map worldwide, and you can see the hardest hit regions are sub-Saharan African countries, where um, you know, more than 10 to 15% of the entire population uh, is infected, and uh, today in the world, there's about 33 million people living with HIV. The, the good thing is that these antiretroviral drugs are available, and they work great. HIV has now been turned into a chronic, actually, problem. You can, you can live with it for years and years. But the key issue still is testing, actually. There is only about one in eight are able to be tested. So um, the main problem currently is to how to find a way to test people and get them to be able to be tested so that you know, whether they are initially infected or not, and then how to manage the disease. So this is what happens uh, when someone is infected with HIV. Uh, HIV is a virus, um, and what happens is that the red line here is the actual HIV RNA copies per ml of plasma. So when someone is infected, this number increases eventually, uh, I mean initially, uh, it drops, uh, the body responds, but then over time, if no, let's say, uh, drugs are, are, are given, then this number will continue to go up. This scale is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, it, can, it can change depending on the, the, the health of the individual, but generally speaking, the viral load will then go up and eventually the person will die. Uh, now, at the same time, what also happens is that the, C that the HIV virus actually very specifically attacks the CD4 positive T lymphocyte, which is a type of white blood cell. It has these CD4 receptors on the surface. This T cell is called the CD4 positive T, T lymphocytes. And this particular cell count is what drops because the virus infects that cell and multiplies and that cell bursts and dies. So that cell count is what drops over time. And in a healthy individual, that number is about 1,000 cells per uh, microliter. This millimeter cube is the same as a microliter per microliter of whole blood. So this number drops and eventually that number would continue to drop, and the clinical definition of HIV is when that number drops below 200 cells per microliter of whole blood. Then that's the clinical uh, definition of, of, of HIV. So you want to either measure the viral load directly or you wanna count the, those particular cells, okay? In terms of the most definitive diagnostics for HIV. Currently, uh, there are, you can look for this antibody, uh, the HIV, it's a P24 antigen that is, that is, that is in the blood, uh, but that, again, it's, a very, it's used as an initial determination, it's not a very quantitative measure, and you can't really stage sort of what the progress of the disease is based on just that. So you really wanna do CD4 T cell count and HIV viral load. These are the two you know, tests that are considered the state of the art or the gold standard. Um, and again, there's been many actually, uh, the, just a month, uh, maybe a month and a half ago, again, it was in the cover of science, the whole problem of HIV, and this is from two years ago, where even in the US, uh, the, the, uh, there was a quote that the biggest challenge is to um, uh, diagnosing all of its HIV-infected uh, people and helping them take advantage of the existing treatments. So, what, how is this currently done? So, flow cytometry is the current gold standard. How many of you know about flow cytometry? Okay, so quite a few. Uh, flow cytometry, so this is sort of this gold standard for cell counting um, or measuring cell, uh, cells in a sample. Uh, it's an optically based technique. You have a, a cell, let's say, you attach based on the surface receptor. You have a fluorescent reporter, and then the cells go through this single file, uh, through, through this flow stream, and then you shine la a laser, and then you can measure the forward scattering and side scattering to count individual cells that express that color, essentially, right? So this system is typically 
hundred, let's say fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, needs a trained technician. It's certainly not portable now. There are groups that are trying to make it smaller and portable, but uh, that hasn't happened at least um, in a commercially available system yet. So. We believe biomems and microfluidics is a solution to all problems in the world. So the goal is to take a drop of blood, put it in a cartridge, and just like the glucose monitoring test, we want to be able to count cells. And that doesn't exist today, at least commercially. And I'll show you an example where we are starting to commercialize it. Um, <clears throat> so in blood, uh, you have half of the blood, let's say about half is plasma, right? And the rest is the cells. So there's lots of platelets, there's red blood cells is the largest number. Per microliter of whole blood, you have about five million red blood cells, uh, about three times lower in magnitude, uh, three orders of magnitude lower is the white blood cells, and we are looking for the CD4 positive T cells within that, which is about a thousand cells per microliter, okay? What are the key criteria? Well, you wanna be able to test whole blood. If you wanna do this in the field or in very remote settings in very difficult situations, you don't wanna draw blood from a venous draw. You want a finger prick, uh, minimal handling or no, no sort of additional processing and handling. Uh, I told you about the dynamic range. You want to go as low as, let's say, 10 to 20 cells per microliter because uh, the threshold was 200, right? So you want to be able to go down, let's say, down to 20 or so, 10 to 20. Low cost and rapid, right? So uh, we've actually been working on different generations of this. Um, we developed uh, this one technology, um, which I'll show you next, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bill Rodriguez at MGH and Mehmet Toner at MGH. And that now is actually being commercialized through a company called Doctari. I'll show you how that works. Uh, then we have developed a generation two, which was actually, um, we had multiple publications on that, but the last one was this past December, um, which now we can count uh, total white blood cell, CD4, and CD8, which is another type of cell which is important for HIV management. And then our generation three actually is something that we are working on now, but the goal is to get to a complete blood cell count, a CBC. And how many of you have gotten a CBC done or a blood test done, right? Everybody. If somebody hasn't, that would be very good. That's very good if you never got a blood test done. So that's the most common test that's done today is a CBC, right? So we wanna be able to get to a CBC from a drop of blood in a truly portable handheld fashion in a, in a device that does it in a portable. And I think we're close to that. So let me tell you a little bit about these various technologies. This is a, a slide from a few years ago, but essentially, Sean Hong Cheng, who is now, she was a postdoc at MGH, worked with our group uh, when I was at Purdue, and now she's a faculty at Lehigh, and Yishao was a postdoc in my group. Um, so the idea here was actually quite simple, but it actually worked, which is good. Good to you know, have something that works in the field eventually. So um, use a microfluidic device, uh, take a drop of blood, flow blood through this microfluidic PDMS device. So this device is made very much like you've learned in the lab's modules in these two weeks, okay? You pour PDMS, you have a mold, you make a channel, very simple channel that's about 50 microns high, few hundred microns wide, few millimeters, centimeter or so long. Actually, we used to do the blood cell capture in the summer module. We didn't do it, I think, explicitly, this white blood cell this year, but we did it last few years where people would then give a drop of blood and actually capture cells from it. Um, so the idea is to then flow whole blood through this and optimize the geometry and the flow rates to capture the specific types of cells. So antibodies are attached inside the microfluidic device. Cells are captured. Once the cells are captured, um, Bill and Mehmet were actually doing this, but just optical method by flowing the fluorescent reporter and then putting the slide in a microscope or the microfluid device in a microscope and counting the cells optically. So what we did was came up with this idea that once the cells are captured, um, and if you integrate electrodes within this device, then if you can change the extracellular solution here, basically, to something that's very low conductivity, low ionic solution, then what happens is that the cells will osmotically burst open very quick in a few minutes or less, and as the cells burst open and spill out all the lysate in the surrounding medium, the electrical conductivity will increase, and if you can measure the electrical conductivity change, then that should be proportional to the number of cells that were captured. And it turns out this technique actually worked very well. Um, so let me show you first the cell capture stuff, which was from some of uh, Sean Hong's original work. So what they did was they then also optimized the flow rate and especially the shear stress um, uh, at the chamber wall. So here you see some images at different 
flow rates and hence different shear stresses. Uh, each dot here is a captured cell. So what you see here is that there's a range of shear stresses in which you get no capture. At very high shear rate, you get no capture. And at this moderate or some optimum shear rate, you get a very high capture. So depending on the number of receptors on the cell surface, um, you can actually get, you can optimize the cell capture to the, to the flow rate and the dimensions then resulting in a specific shear stress, okay? So you can actually optimize this for CD4 T cells, for monocytes or for other types of cells. And you can get very high, if you optimize this, you can certainly get over 85 to 90% capture efficiency. So you can capture cells pretty easily. And this works easier than, than you think. It's a very, actually works very reliably. Uh, and one thing that really helps us here, I'm just gonna kind of show the basic idea without getting into a lot of detail, is this, uh, when, I mean, how do cells get to the surface? How do cells actually get to the interface to actually be captured, right? So um, what happens there is this effect called the margination effect, which is sort of well known in fluidics and also especially in blood flow and real, in blood rheology, that when you have whole blood especially, then platelets and leukocytes are actually, they're segregated to the side wall because yeah, there's so many red blood cells. The, the red blood cells push the white blood cells on, and the platelets uh, on the sides, and the red blood cells move through. Uh, this is an actual picture from a microfluidic device, but it's very similar videos and images you can find online, actually. And you see that the white blood cells get segregated to the sidewall. So just the fact that it's whole blood actually helps to get the white blood cells to the sidewall. And that's exactly what happens in our blood vessels, and that's exactly how some of these, let's say, epithelial cells or other cells would get to the sidewall and then eventually maybe get to the sidewall when, let's say, they metastasize in a different site for cancer. So it turns out that the whole blood, the using whole blood actually helps us in this case and you can get very good capture efficiencies. If you didn't have whole blood, which I'll show you later, then you need to come up with ways to increase that contact or increase the opportunity for the cells to get to the sidewall, okay? Otherwise, they will only get to the sidewall by sedimentation, okay? okay. So let me just very briefly then review a couple of electrical impedance, very sort of basic, uh, supposed to be a lecture, so a couple of basic uh, ideas rather than just research results. So then we measure the electrical impedance and a lot of sensors we develop within our group are based on electrical measurements. So impedance is the measurement uh, or the ability uh, of a circuit or electrical element to resist the flow, right? So you can have capacitors, resistors, inductors, and you can use these properties in a micro scale or a nano scale to measure various or interrogate various biological phenomena. So you apply a voltage, you measure the resultant current or vice versa, and the ratio here, right, from Ohm's law gives you a complex impedance which has some phase information also. So using this information, then you can interrogate the material that you are, that you are, that you're measuring. And the components in that material their electrical properties then affect the net impedance, right? So um, what we do for this, for this measurement is exactly that we just measure the electrical impedance. We apply a voltage and measure the current and measure the net impedance uh, of the medium. So we have electrodes built into the device uh, and then you would measure the impedance uh, as a function of time. So as the cells lice, you will see an impedance change essentially. And it turns out that if you try to calculate um, the various, so let's say the volume of a cell is about 0.2 picoliters, if you try to actually calculate the volume, contains about 10 to the minus 14 molar ions, and it turns out that if you were to just try to get the cells to attach to the surface and measure the resultant change in surface capacitance, you will not see a signal because the the, the, the number of cells that are being captured is very, very small. We're talking about 20 to 30 cells per microliter, right? So, but when the cells lice, they dump all these ions in the medium, then you get this huge amplification effect. And you can actually measure the signal from the lysate of 20 cells, but you'll not measure the 20 cells captured directly, essentially, okay? So this plot then shows probably a little bit right on the right. You can see the different number of cells per microliter and the change in the impedance as a function of frequency. So you see this, the, the, the more this, the number of cells that were lysed, the lower the impedance. Um, 
and we can go down to as high as 3,000 cells in this experiment, and as low as about 20 cells per microliter, you can actually see the difference from the background or from zero cells, essentially, okay? So we have that dynamic range that we would like, which is great. Um, and on the left here, you see um, the lysing process, or the characterization of the lysing process. So this is the percent of intact cells. So how many cells are still intact that we optically measured? in different um, sugar solutions, essentially. So these are low ionic solutions that would have, that would allow the cells to lyse, essentially. But depending on this concentrations that you can pick, you can actually see control the lysing. Here, none of the cells lyse for this particular mixture, whereas the other extreme is this one with 1.1% sucrose and a little bit of dextrose, where all the cells lyse in two minutes, okay? So in about 110, 120 seconds, all the cells can, can lyse. And this is important to control because if the cell lysate flows out before you measure, then you're not gonna get a signal. So it's important to control this time and have it in a couple of minutes so you can exchange the solution and then get the cells to lyse and measure. So uh, that's, that's the basic technology behind this company called Daktari Diagnostics. You can look up the, the webpage if you like and uh, it's actually been a very uh, exciting experience. Bill Rodriguez is our CEO. He left MGH and started the company himself and has been doing it for the last five years, which is great because he's just the perfect person to do this. Um, and he, so a lot of our initial lab prototypes, large LCR meters and syringe pumps and uh, so microflu, when we talk about microfluidics, I think if you go to the lab, you'll see that even though the device is this tiny, there's all this instrument around it that's certainly not micro. <laughs> so to drive a microfluidic device, usually you need a pump, right? And that, so the, the challenge was to build, to put all this in a, so this, this, is, this box is a portable, um, uh, the size of a small toaster, essentially. Um, and this is a cartridge that takes a blood drop at the end. It has three pouches with prepackaged solutions for this lysing, washing, uh, and uh, this, the, this actually works. It's been tested and we have lots of data from four different African, sub-Saharan African countries. And this year it's actually being released to production, which is, which is very exciting. Uh, and very difficult settings where this is gonna be used. Uh, it will still probably be used by healthcare providers or healthcare workers. They'll go to different places and do the test. Um, but it, it still needs to be very easy to use. Okay, so that's one, one generation. So let me go to the next one and um, talk about another electrical approach, which is this Coulter counting. So Coulter, how many of you have heard of a Coulter counter? So, okay, so Coulter counters are also commercially available devices, right? Beckman Coulter makes them, Beckman Institute across, so it's the same, same connection. Um, so this approach has been around for a long time, and um, the basic idea is that you have an aperture, you have a fluid, you drive cells through this, whether it's through pressure or through most of the time actually applying an electric field and driving the devices, uh, I mean driving the, the, the particles through that, through that uh, device or through that aperture. And then while that's happening, you measure the current uh, uh, through that aperture. So you measure the current versus time, you will see some current, and then when the particle goes through, you will see the current change, whether it's a drop or an increase, it could change depending on the properties of the particle. So you will see the current decrease or increase, but you'll see a pulse, right? So you can count each particle as, it, as it's going through, okay? That's the basic idea of a Coulter, Coulter counter or the Coulter principle. So in our next generation, we wanted to actually be able to count different types of cells and count subtypes. So we decided to use this principle, but then enhance and add to it um, and the idea was the following. So we, if you wanted to, for example, measure uh, total white blood cell count also, along with uh, specific types of cells. So the approach was the following. Um, we take whole blood, uh, and then we run it through a microfluidic mixture, and we flow a red blood cell lysis buffer, so a, solution, a buffer solution that would lyse the red blood cells selectively. Uh, and then um, we take the mixture, which will now have really only the white blood cells, and we put electrodes within a channel to count those cells as they're going by. So what you see here is a picture of these devices. Uh, this is a 15 by 15 micron cross-sectional channel that connects these two larger chambers. So the cells will go through here in a single file, 
and there are these electrodes that are patterned that would measure the electrical activity change as the cells go by over the electrodes, okay? So the idea is then you count all the cells going through, that gives you the total white blood cell count, and then now you have a chamber to capture the specific types of cells. So if we put antibodies for CD4 T cells, we can capture those cells, but now we won't lyse them like the previous approach. We would actually, we could actually, but the idea is to um, count what's going out. So put another electrical counter, multiplex Coulter counters, and now you count what's going out. So the difference will now tell you what's been captured. So just the difference of those two numbers will tell you what's been captured. And this in some way turns out to be more scalable. Um, it doesn't require that lysing, so you can, you can kind of get the data sort of in real time. You don't need additional buffers to do the lysing, and it has some advantages. Potentially, it's more complex, but it has some advantages. You can get more information, certainly. So this is how that device kind of looks like, um, which is about the size of a credit card. It has the blood inlet comes here. There's a lysing region. There's a, you have to also quench the lysing process because that solution is reasonably harsh. It's, it's an uh, uh, acid, essentially a dilute acid that, at, that attacks the red blood cells. But if you can quickly quench it, then you don't damage the white blood cells. So you have to quench. And then you go through two counters, and in between there's a capture region, essentially where cells are captured. Um, let me show you this video real quick. So this is actual real-time video, whole blood coming in here, coming through, and then what you see on the right, and so here the, the, the lysing solution is coming in, and you see this blood flow stream in the middle, and just in a few seconds as you go down, you're, you're uh, moving down here, you see that the red blood cells are getting lysed, essentially. It starts to become transparent, so the red blood cells are all getting lysed. And if you look close enough, or if I stop, you will see some speckles, white speckles going by, those are the white blood cells. You will see some cells still. And remember, the white blood cells were like 10 to the three, and red blood cells were 10 to the six per microliter. So the solution gets pretty dilute, and the white blood cells are very few compared to the red blood cells, right, that were lysed. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's the lysing and the quenching region, okay? And then the data you get actually is um, more like a flow cytometer data except that it's these electrical pulses. Um, and that's, you know, um, essentially uh, you, can, you can then try to find different algorithms to count that. But what's interesting here is that you can indeed see different distributions for lymphocytes versus granulocytes and monocytes, which have difference in size and a little bit difference in the electrical properties, but mainly difference in size. And so that's actually nice because you can get that at the entrance counter and you can get that at the exit counter. And then what you wanna do is separate or subtract these, these lymphocyte population only, and that gives you the CD4 T cell count, which is a specific type of lymphocyte, okay? Any questions, does this make sense? So uh, now the cell capture part, let me just briefly show that. So in this case, the red blood cells are lysed, right? So how do we get good capture efficiency? Because there is no margination effect. So here again, we borrow something from literature that was already there, and actually Mehmet's group worked on it first to show for CTCs. But if you can figure out geometries to increase the surface area to volume ratio. So if you can figure out ways to get more interaction between the white blood cells and the surface, so we do that by adding these posts. So if you make the entire chamber basically a bunch of posts, so as the blood cells are going through, there's a lot more uh, points of interaction. Uh, if it was just a planar chamber, then the white blood cell capture efficiency, I didn't put it here, it's like 30 to 40%. But with the, with the posts and antibodies attached to the post, we can get capture efficiencies at the right flow rate in the order of greater than 85, 90%. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, been characterized and optimized. Okay. So finally then, we put it all together and we get actual blood samples. This is data from healthy donors. Our IRBs are approved, of course, through campus. We de-identify samples, so we have volunteers that come and give blood, but it's de-identified. And this is from healthy donors. So what you see on the x-axis is the data from flow cytometry from the from the Carl Hospital lab, which is close by, so they have a commercial lab, we send the sample there for a control, and then the y-axis is the data from our lab, 
and what you see is a very good correlation um, between the two measurements. Essentially, you want this to be a straight line with a slope of as close as one, and a good, you know, so 0 0.89, 0 0.88 is actually reasonably, it's actually quite good. People are pretty happy with that, and we are continuing to add more data to this. Uh, this right here is CD8, so we can do CD4 and CD8, and again, you see a very good correlation between the, the flow cytometer, which is this big instrument in the lab, versus uh, y-axis is our data. So how much is the... I'm sorry? How much is the microfluid comparing to the flow cytometer? Uh, you mean the cost? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, so that's the hope, is the cost of this cartridge eventually when it's mass produced, I think it can be less than $10 oh. per, per test. And the instrument is maybe $1,000 or less. Yeah. Uh, then this is data from infected patients. We got an IRB approved for HIV infected patients at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, which is a public clinic. Uh, patients come there to get medication, to get the drugs. Um, so, um, uh, and you can see here that th this is also, the, the correlation is very good between the flow cytometry control and from our chip control. The correlation is quite, quite good. And this is for CD8. So um, this data right here, this is from infected patients, but what can you comment about the range here? What do you notice about the range? The range of the cell count. Right, so the, a healthy individual, if you look at this data, right, it's from 600 to about 1,000. These are people who are not infected with HIV, as far as they don't know. <laughs> And uh, this right here is people who are infected, they, they know, right? So the fact is the number is actually very similar. And why is that? Because they're on the ARV drugs, and those drugs work very well. As a matter of fact, there's only three points down here that are below the actual cutoff. So that's actually one of the issues here in, in, in general is that people who are coming to clinic are either the first time or they know they have it, so their numbers are already pretty good. So we actually need to test our technology, again, in settings where there is more patients available or more individuals available where that count is actually low to test the technology, right? Yes? If you test someone initially, how do you know like, if someone has HIV? What if this is still part of the early, I guess, stages of HIV where this, he or she still has like a relatively high cell count? Uh, cell count. So you don't know. That's a very good question. You don't know you start to really, I mean, the, the actual clinical manifestation is when that cell count starts to drop. Okay. That's really, or the viral load starts to go up. Okay, and then when, when do you say, okay, below this number, then you find possible? It's 200 cells per microliter. That was the clinical definition. When that number... Well, not, not AIDS, but like HIV. That's exactly the same. Yeah. Oh, okay. Having someone say whether they have HIV or AIDS is the same thing. And that number is below 200 cells per microliter. Okay. So I think you know this is another technology we're very excited about. It actually works, gives good data, and we're going to continue to move this forward. And this is where now we're actually working towards developing a CBC from a drop of blood. If you can do a three, so if you can do red blood cells, platelets, um, and essentially those are all the basic cell types from a, from blood. So if we can, you know, RBC very important for anemia, other blood abnormalities, platelets, very important for clotting, viral infection, also for cancer. Monocytes is a very important number to look at. Lymphocytes overall, and also specifically for HIV, for the subtypes, right? So clearly, uh, if you can do, so actually we have recently, a post, some of my postdoc and students have started another company called Electrocyte, which we're gonna try to do this, actually CBC, as a, as a, as a goal, and we're working towards that. All right, okay, so let me, uh, I think we have another like uh, 15, 20 minutes, I believe. How much time do I have? Who has a schedule? I'm supposed to be keeping my schedule. Till three? three? All right, I'll keep moving. So uh, I'll go through this actually very quickly because I wanna show the next, next project. But the, the challenge, so as far as I'm concerned, I think the challenge of CD4 cell count is solved. <laughs> we have two approaches and I think we can make it work. And there's other competing approaches, of course, that people are working on, but. So the next really grand challenge that hasn't been solved yet is doing the viral load from a finger prick. You can do a viral load from a blood draw, but the viral load is still a challenge. And there's some reports, there's actually some work from our campus, from other groups also, but still, that's still an unmet uh, 
need uh, where if you can just take a drop of blood and do the viral load count. So if you go back to the plot that had the viral load, the spec is about the same in terms of numbers. You're looking for about 20 RNA copies or 20 particles or 20 viruses per microliter all the way up to many thousands. If someone's heavily infected, that number can be in thousands. So we're talking about minimum of about 20 viral particles from a drop of blood, and that's a big challenge. So that has not been done yet. Uh, we have some technology that we are working towards that uh, by doing PCR uh, in droplets. So how many of you know PCR? So quite a few. PCR is the gold standard for doing DNA amplification. So if you want, uh, you want to detect this virus, you actually do look at this, it's RNA essentially, and um, uh, that can be done by PCR amplification. So we have this approach where we, we published it last year, where essentially we came up with a way to do uh, localized uh, heating using silicon transistors, so using on-chip devices. So we make these transistors on a chip, and we put droplets on each transistor. The droplet you can see here is about 100 microns in diameter. And now using this silicon nanowire transistor, we can actually make it, make it be used as a heater. We can, we can apply an AC field across the wire and the back through the buried oxide, and you apply an AC field uh, you get these fringing fields at the edges, and if that's an AC field, then you can actually get this thermal power in that volume, depending on the frequency of the signal and the fact that you are oscillating these water molecules at a specific frequency. So you can actually get heating. And those heating, uh, that, that heating can be in the range that you're interested in for PCR. So uh, now how do you measure the temperature? So we did that by using a double-stranded DNA as a temperature probe by using um, essentially um, a FRET, you know, a fluorescence, um, basically a FRET probe um, where if the two strands are together, then you don't get any, any fluorescence coming off. When they melt, you actually get fluorescence, you get light. And that's exactly what you do in when you do a melting temperature. When you do a melting curve, that's what you do. So let me just show you this middle one, just look at that. The x-axis is the voltage applied on that transistor, and the y-axis is the fluorescence. So what it shows is that as you increase the, uh, the voltage, you can get heating, and the fluorescence increases. So the strands are coming off. And this is inside that droplet. So we can do that at uh, a strand that was designed to melt at 50, 61, or 80. And you know, PCR temperature, you need to get to like closer to 90. So we're close, and we could do technically heating within the droplet. And that could be very, very rapid. So our goal here essentially is to try to see if we can turn PCR into a point of care cartridge, essentially. So it can be done in, let's say, a few minutes or less. <clears throat> and we're working towards that. But that's sort of one basic element of the heating piece itself, all right? Okay, in the last, I think, few minutes, let me give you a quick um, overview of this project, um, which is, um, uh, uses a similar electrical technology, but now a targeting detection of cancer, early detection of cancer. Um, and I won't get into, of course, the challenge, right? We know cancer, huge problem in the US, second largest, if not the, very close to the largest killer, largest is heart disease in the, um, but the epigenetics of cancer is very important. So you heard in the biology lectures about the genes and the sequence, sequence, right? How many of you know about epigenome or epigenetics? So a few. Uh, but this is certainly very important, especially for cancer, and I think people now believe for lots of diseases. So the idea is that you have the sequence information, but you also have this additional layer of DNA methylation, where the C, the cytosine, right, the A, G, T, C, the the C gets this, this five prime position right here, gets methylated. So that one little methyl group gets added and it, everything <laughs> can change. So uh, a normal DNA will have a certain methylation pattern, whatever the methylation pattern is, meaning some Cs will be methylated, some Cs will not be methylated. Whereas it's not been shown that for many cancers there are genes that are, the methylation status has changed. They get hypermethylated, meaning more Cs get methylated, or hypomethylated, less Cs get methylated. 
And um, what happens is that there is this CPG dinucleotide essentially form. It happens in a C, you have a C and a G next to each other, and that C is what gets methylated. The complementary sequence will have a G and a C, and this whole thing is called a CPG dinucleotide. So that will get methylated at both ends, and that essentially will change downstream expression of proteins or something. So, and what happens is that DNA gets methylated. Um, there is a thing called methyl transferase. There is an enzyme that actually will methylate, and we don't know why it does or how it does or why it changes, but there is an abnormality and it changes. And then it recruits this protein called methyl binding, a protein that has a methyl binding domain. So there's a protein that goes and binds to that specific CPG dinucleotide. And if so, you have a DNA, and it's got this protein now bound to it, and as you can imagine now that other transcription factors, if they want to go along and read the sequence, they can't because this protein is there. So it can prevent further transcription factor binding and all sorts of things don't go right then, okay? So how do you detect this methylation? Well, there's many different techniques for it. Uh, the problem, you might say, well, I can use PCR, but you can't because when you do PCR, you actually lose that information. You, when you amplify a C and if it's methylated, the, the, when you amplify it, you, the, the methylation information is not preserved, and that's the key problem. So for methylation, there's a very complicated techniques that bisulfide genomic sequences, methylation-specific primers, and other more very cumbersome techniques. So our, let me just give you our, our twist to this thing is using a nanopore, which again is a nanoscale culture counter. So what you do is, can you make a, a nanoscale pore, a single pore, that you can pass a single DNA through, okay? And if the DNA can be moved through, then this is something that people have shown, lots of groups have shown that you can make this single pore in a membrane, put DNA on one side, and apply a voltage, and the DNA will move because it's got a negative charge, so just like electrophoresis, it will actually move through that single pore, and if you're measuring the current, you will see this background current, and when the DNA comes through, it will block, and you see this pulse downwards. So just like the culture counter for cells, this is a, a culture counter for DNA molecules, okay? It's a single molecule counter. So our approach was um, to actually, there's a collaboration with uh, colleagues at Mayo Clinic, our approach was to use that protein that binds to the CPG dinucleotide, use it as a physical label. So now you have, for example, a DNA strand which will have no protein if it's not methylated, and the methylated protein, can, you, can, you can get that protein to, to bind to the methylated site, right? So now if you look top down, for example, in the pore, you will see this molecule, but it's got this protein hanging off the side. So effectively, the diameter of that, pro of that complex is changing, right? So now if you take that DNA and if you run it through this nanopore, can you see a difference in signature, electrical signature, that would indicate whether the protein was methylated, whether the DNA was methylated or not? So we d did that and it actually works. It's very interesting results. So here you see lots of pulses from DNA that was unmethylated. Okay, each pulse downward is one single DNA molecule. But then when you mix actually methylated and unmethylated DNA, but methylated DNA with a complex, you see some pulses here that are very deep, certain number of pulses that are much deeper. And if you expand actually the x-axis, the time axis, you also see that they have very different signatures. So this is a pulse from a DNA only, and this is a pulse with DNA with, which has got multiple proteins bound to it. So you can see that the pulse is deeper, and also it takes a lot longer for it to go through the pore when it's got these proteins attached to it. So it's got a different mass, yeah. but also a different charge, because the protein does change the charge a little bit, but the biggest factor that controls that is then the interaction between the pore sidewall. So if the pore sidewall, if, if the pore diameter is picked correctly, you have the molecule go through, but it also interacts. So essentially, you see the, the complex slowing down. It takes a lot longer for it to go through, essentially through the channel, okay? So essentially, if you have a molecule that has nothing attached to it versus a molecule that has proteins attached to it, you see very different signatures. And as a matter of fact, the number of signatures 
or the amount or the, or the characteristic of the signature is very different depending on how many proteins are actually attached. So here you have one DNA and 30 proteins. Here you have one DNA and five proteins, and here you have like one DNA and one protein. Does it mean an amount also or a protein? This is a whole MBD, that methyl binding domain protein, which is a 17 kilodalton protein. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, it's a fragment, but it's a 17 kilodalton protein. It spans about five to six bases. So, you know, it's about 20 to 30, it's like 20 angstroms. So why don't you just add an antibody on top of this? To make it even enhanced? Bigger. You could. The key issue is that, the, the key problem with this approach is that it does span about five to six bases. So if you have two methylated sites that are close, you're not gonna be able to label each one. So the bigger your physical label gets, you're gonna lose some spatial resolution. But yes, you can put a bigger label on top of it to get a better signal. Yeah. So, and what was interesting was that you can even see very clear signatures uh, that are different when you have one protein to one DNA. So pr one, D one DNA molecule that's, that's naked, has nothing attached to it, versus even one DNA molecule with a ratio of one to one, essentially. When we mix it one to one ratio, you can see uh, very different signatures to that. So this is very exciting. You can uh, actually detect uh, at least hypermethylation or not. It turns out that our clinical collaborators, they're very interested in a technique that takes small amount of sample, very small samples, and just detect hypermethylation or hypomethylation. Um, uh, they found that there is a specific gene for upper GI cancer uh, that is found in stool samples that they can extract, and that is directly, the, the methylation status is directly correlated to upper GI cancer. So right now, the way you test now is a colonoscopy, or in some, many cases, you can't reach the upper GI very easily. So, whereas if you, can, if you can look at that methylation profile, it's a pretty definitive um, uh, diagnosis for upper GI cancer. So they have a company and they're trying to commercialize that test, actually getting through FDA approval, but it's very difficult to do. Uh, the sample prep is very problematic. That amplification, current amplification methods don't work very well. So if you can come up with some way to actually detect methylation from, gene, from genes that are extracted, it would be, it would be very useful. So we're, that's what we're working on, and we have, uh, we have done different lengths, 30, 60, 90, actually. This is 90 base pairs. The one I showed earlier was 800 base pairs, and it works. The technique actually works for as low as 30 base pair long DNA strands. Um, and our next steps here actually are to try to see if we can profile, uh, get more measurements across the DNA, and that's where actually graphene would be very useful because graphene is an ultra-thin membrane. So um, we have some structures that we have been working on towards that. But really our key challenge is to actually integrate the sample prep. So what we are working on now is to take magnetic beads that have the primers to capture specific genes, uh, integrate that with a microfluidic device, capture the beads, uh, hopefully cut the double-stranded DNA with the protein, and then run it through a pore. So we are working on this integrated approach now that hopefully will take it from a real sample uh, to, the, to the result. Can you do it on chromosomal level? So that's the other level of methylation. We haven't done any work on it directly, but fundamentally you could do that because those histones, the histone modification, right, and histones in the middle of that DNA would act like physical labels. We haven't run entire, yeah, much longer than a few thousand kilobases. I mean, a few thousand bases. Uh, you could technically, you could technically do that. We just haven't done anything on the chromosomal base. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I'll stop there, given the time. So I talked to you about. Uh, let me just um, um, skip to to the end. And just, uh, I always have more slides I need to present, but I'll. Right. So. Uh, diagnostics for HIV, so I talked to you about an electrical cell counter, right, for uh, specific types of white blood cells or um, total white blood cells or hopefully soon all types of blood from, uh, all types of cells from blood. And then there, certainly our next grand challenge is a point of care HIV viral load. That's really what's not been accomplished yet. Uh, diagnostics for cancer, we are very interested in looking at these new types of markers like epigenetics. 
So if we can come up with a way to detect methylation, that would be very, very useful. Um, and then uh, certainly all my you know, grad students and funding agencies and lots of collaborators. We collaborate with lots of different people from all over the place. Uh, and uh, all, of course, the students that do the real work. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Just like a seven minutes over, so. or maybe. No, I think it was three fifteen. Oh, three fifteen. So great. So I actually rushed. All right, I have eight minutes. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. So, uh, so the next thing you are targeting to uh, thinner membranes. Is there a technique There's what? I'm sorry. MOS two. Yes, absolutely, that's a very good question. So the question is why a thinner membrane and why graphene? So the idea is that currently, let me just actually go back to that slide, one second. So to answer your question very quickly, uh, it could be graphene, it could be MOS2, uh, it could be boron nitride. Um, any of those will work for what we are trying to do. We are trying to use something that is also electrically conducting. So certainly uh, MOS2 would, would, be, would be useful. Born nitride might not work for that reason. It's an insulator. Uh, but the key thing is to think about is that why a thinner membrane, right? So if you're trying to profile, so your spatial resolution is a function of how thick the membrane is. If the membrane is very thick, and you have five proteins on the DNA within the membrane, then you're not gonna be able to distinguish them. And that's why if you make the membrane thinner and thinner, and ideally speaking, if you make the membrane thinner than the size of the protein, you could potentially profile each, like you can get a blip when each protein goes through. So that's the idea. If you can use a graphene or a, something very thin, then uh, you could get a little blip for each protein. And then you can get profiling, which is really the ultimate goal, certainly. Well, something that's thinner than the something that's thinner than the size of one protein, right? Yeah. So, so uh, we have also published on that's what I was showing, but I went through very quickly this process where we can get stacks of graphene. So we can transfer a graphene, put a dielectric graphene one, dielectric one, then graphene two. We can put a second graphene and another dielectric, and then we can address the graphene. So I have a student, a PhD student in material science that's trying to make um, electrical contacts to the graphene and trying to measure electrical properties as you get DNA to move through. So make a third, three terminal device if we can. Yeah, um, so I thought it was really interesting when you talked about the PCR. Um, part and how like, we can get into the little walls and right. all that. But um, the question I have is, like, you know, like for PCRs, like there's many different steps, right? right. So like in and like, um, all, right. all those different steps, and like sometimes it takes a long time. So how far are you guys in that? And like, is RNA amplification like we know that the strands don't have to split up? So Right, so that's a loaded question. I can talk more detail, but I, the, so the, the, the goal of trying to um, reduce the total time involves being able to heat and cool very, very rapidly. And there's lots of papers actually on that in terms of how can you heat and cool very rapidly. So the state of the art, people have shown even one, one cycle of that, you know, uh, 50, 70 to 95, all within even, let's say, 30 to 40 seconds, right? Or even less. So I think the fastest have been 40 cycle, 30 cycles in maybe five minutes or so. Or even some reports of even less. So there are, I think, techniques. So our, the, what we are hoping for is that by putting it in droplets, the thermal mass becomes very small. And then you can very quickly heat and cool each droplet versus something that was, you say, you know, milliliters or microliters or whatever. So the reason for trying to dispense it in droplets is that then you can, your, your thermal mass becomes very small. Now the pre-processing steps, yes, very good question. And that's why for every project we try to always make sure that we know what sample we are starting with. And um, so for that, you will, st like for PCR, you still have to try to of course do the lysing of the organism. You gotta get the, 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 the DNA out of the bacteria or the virus. So there's always a chemical lysing, or a temperature lysing that has to be incorporated. 
you probably have to clean up the sample a little bit. That's why doing PCR in whole blood is always very problematic because there's all these inhibitors that inhibit PCR. So the sample prep becomes critical in any of that, in any of these approaches. Um, yeah. There's other methods too. So we have, uh, we have worked on something called LAMP uh, or these isothermal methods. So PCR is one where you need to change the temperature, uh, multiple temperatures, but there are other methods which are called isothermal amplification methods where you maintain the temperature only at one value. And uh, they are what's called, uh, they are what's, uh, uh, they're based on what's called strand displacement polymerases or polymerases that actually break the strand also. Because when you're doing the temperature, what the temperature is doing in PCR is to get the strands to separate. But there are enzymes that would actually um, break the strand and separate the strand. And they would, then those approaches work at one temperature. So only at 45 or 50 degrees, for example, you can get amplification through a process called LAMP. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much.